joyful certainties. There are some tremendous realities, tremendous realities that are forever fixed. Uh, they are constant, they are perpetual, they're not subject to, uh, to uh, uh, being destroyed or being uh, removed from power and influence by any experience or any power or any, any entity whatsoever. They are constant, they are perpetual, and these realities bring great joy to us as sincere followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. I call them, therefore, joyful certainties, and we're finding them here in the book of Philippians as we're analyzing Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Now, I want to point out something to you. I want to point out to you, you, you've got to keep in mind that these joyful certainties are exclusively the possession of those who by the grace of God are genuine followers of the Lord Jesus. Amen. These joyful certainties are not for anyone outside of the experience of the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. They are the possession only of those who know the Lord's forgiveness and who are seeking by God's grace to live daily as a follower of Christ. We saw last week that we have joy in Christian fellowship. We saw that we rejoice in the fellowship of God's people, the fellowship of the church. We rejoice in the fellowship of the church because it is based upon the saving grace of God. There is no fellowship that exists that has a greater foundation to it than the foundation of our fellowship. We, we celebrate the reality that the grace of God has made us God's people. We rejoice in the fellowship of, of the church because it is a fellowship in which God works. God is at work among us. Yes, and we rejoice in the, in the fellowship of God's people because it is the particular sphere of the, of the working of God, the realm of the working of God in which He is bringing glory to His name through His people. Yes. And then we saw that we rejoice in the fellowship of the church because it's a fellowship in which the love of Jesus just unites us together. We love the fellowship of God's people because God has placed His love within our heart for one another. Paul loved the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi loved him. And that love that was characteristic of their relationship should be characteristic of the relationship of all believers. The love of Jesus should mark us as the people of God. Then this morning we move on to our next great reality. And that is that we joy in Christian faith. We joy in our Christian faith. Now sometimes we use that word faith to make reference to the body of truth that we, that we uh, recognize and commit ourselves to. The, the body of, of real truth that God has revealed to us in the Bible. But here we're talking about the practical experiencing of trusting the Lord. Amen. That uh, faith experience that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our confidence in God is what I'm talking about. Our confidence in the Lord, our confidence in the work of God, Amen. and our confidence in God in His care for us in His work yes. brings us great joy. You can't have real joy apart from peace, can you? And you can't have peace apart from trust. Amen. Trust in God brings Peace and peace enables us to have joy. Joy requires peace, and peace is a fruit of faith. Here in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, our text is going to come from chapter 1, but in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, the Bible tells us there that we're not to be worried about it. Be careful for nothing. Don't be worried about anything, the Bible says, but instead, if with, with our thanksgiving. We are, we are with, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. We let our requests be made known to God. And the result of that is what? The peace of God that goes beyond understanding will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so we have peace as we have confidence in God. And that peace enables us 
to have the kind of joy that Paul here is demonstrating as he writes the book of Philippians and the kind of joy that he is calling the Philippian believers to here also in our text. Let me give you a couple of other verses before we delve into our passage. You'll see these on the screen. Psalm 33 verses 20 and 21. Look at what the Bible says there. Talking about our confidence in the Lord. Verse 20 of Psalm 33 says, We wait for the Lord. Yes. That, is, that is a waiting with confidence. <clears throat> we put our trust in the Lord and we are anticipating the work of God. The blessing of God. The intervention of God. We wait for the Lord. He is our help Amen. and our shield. For our hearts do what? Rejoice in Him. Because why? We trust in His holy name. We're able to have joy because we trust in Him. And we trust in Him because we know He's trustworthy. Yes, amen. And so we have an anchor for our life, an anchor for our soul in the Lord. Yes. And then one other verse right quickly before we delve into the text. Romans chapter 15 verse 13. Look at what Paul says here as he is he's expressing his prayer for the believers in Rome. He says, now may the God of hope He's the God of hope, right? He is our hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. We're able to have joy because He is the God of hope. Amen. The God of hope gives us joy. He fills us with all joy and peace in believing. Amen. In exercising our confidence in God, we have peace. In exercising our confidence in God, we have joy. And so joy comes as we have peace in the Lord. And peace is the fruit of our faith. So what is this joy-giving faith that we find here in our text? Let's dig into the passage. The first thing I want you to notice with me here uh, from our scripture in the, in the uh, first uh, chapter here in verses 12 and following is that we have faith that God is advancing His work even in the most difficult circumstances. Yes, amen. We need to have confidence. We ought to have confidence. It's only right that we have confidence in God that He is advancing His work whether we see that or not. Yes. Whether we can look around about us and see the hand of God or not. We have confidence in God that He is indeed advancing his word. Many of us studied that this morning in our life groups, right? As we saw that lived out with Esther. God was advancing his word even though Esther was not aware of it. Even though no one could look and see what was going on, God was at work. And I want you to know that God is at work in the details of your life and in my life, whether we see it or not. God's at work. And sometimes we're walking around in, in great confusion and trying to figure out what in the world is God doing? And is God doing anything at all? But I tell you, God is at work. Yes, God is always at work. And God never takes a hiatus away from His work. God is working in my life and in your life and we can live with confidence in that. Amen. Oh, look at verses 12 and following and, and remember the context. As we read these verses, remember the context. Paul is in prison in Rome. Paul, Paul, according to the historians, would have had a Roman soldier chained to him. 24 hours a day, a Roman soldier chained to him. Now when you read the last two verses of the book of Acts, and you find that, that Paul was actually living there uh, in house arrest, and that he was living in, a, in his own little house. You might think, well, it wasn't too awful bad. Well, who, who among us this morning would like to be chained to a soldier 24 hours a day for two years? Would you like that life? I, I, I don't think I would care for that life. If, if somebody came in the, uh, the front doors of the church and asked for volunteers for that kind of life, I don't think any of us would be, oh, please pick me, kind of thing. You know? right. he, was, he was confined to his living quarters. 
and he was chained to a Roman soldier. And you know what? He knows that this is just one more chapter. And he knows that things aren't looking good for him in the Roman Empire. He, he knows that, that, that life has been tough. Life is tough now for him as a follower of Jesus. And it's going to be tough. And he's just a couple of years away from being beheaded for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tough, tough circumstances for the Apostle Paul. But yet he says this in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advancement of the gospel. Now you talk about a positive attitude. That's a positive attitude. You know, he, he's not saying, guys, would you please feel sorry for me? You know, please pray for me. This is a tough life I live. These are difficult days I'm going through. You don't find that anywhere in the book of Philippians. You don't find it at all. He, he's not. He's not complaining. He's not having a pity party. He's not feeling sorry for himself in one moment of this. But instead, you know what he says? Guys, it may look bad. And this is not a, a, a circumstance that I'm trying to downplay. But you know what? It's worth it. Because the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is being advanced. Yes, amen. Isn't that something? He would say, he would say, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advancement of the gospel, verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, the praetorium guard of, of Rome, uh, that, that I am, and to everyone else, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, how many times a day do you think that Roman soldier chained to the Apostle Paul heard the gospel? <laughs> right? And you know what? They had, to, they had to be changed out every day. Every day you get another soldier chained to you. And so Paul, for two years, he's just got, you talk about a captive audience. <laughs> the soldier thought that Paul was his prisoner. Paul looked at the Roman soldier and said, no, you've got to turn around. You're my prisoner. Right? And so Paul capitalized on that opportunity of sharing the gospel. And we will bellyache, you know, about a bad situation, a tough, a tough circumstance or something. You know the reason why God may send you to the emergency room? It might be you need to witness to a nurse or a doctor there or something. You know, we just need to understand that, that our negative situations in our life give us the opportunity to be a tremendous witness for the Lord and to show forth the power and the sufficiency of God's grace that gets us through and is with us whether we're in the valley or whether we're on the mountaintop. And God gives us the opportunity of showing people that Jesus really does work and that, and that there is nothing that is greater than the grace of God in our life. And so Paul just says, you know what? It's just all about the Lord. Amen. And my, my God has not lost control. Yes. He's still in charge. I love the way that Paul would refer to himself. He always referred to himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ when he was incarcerated. He never said, I'm the prisoner of Caesar. He never said, I'm the prisoner of Rome. He would say, I'm the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great way to look at yourself. Paul said, God's in charge. He's in, he's in charge of the details of my life. And in that setting where Paul was, was chained to these Roman soldiers, he says that what has happened, the result of this, is that, is that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. All the soldiers know it, that my imprisonment is for Christ. It's for Christ. When you read those last two verses of, of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, you find Paul there at the, at the Roman prison at that time and being on house arrest. Here's what it says about his situation. It says, then he stayed two whole years in his own rented house. That's there for house arrest, chained to a soldier, but he's there in his own rented house. And yet he had freedom to receive guests. The door was open. He just had to be confined. But he was able to have 
He was able to have Bible study. He was able to, to teach and to preach. And he says here that he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with full boldness and without hindrance. Amen. And so they could, they could uh, chain Paul up if they wanted to, but they could not chain up his tongue. And he just continued on talking about Jesus. And then not only was there that local advancement of the gospel with Paul there in Rome, but look at the effect that it had upon all the churches in verse 14. Most of the brothers in the Lord have gained confidence from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the message fearlessly. Here's what he's saying. He's saying there are other Christians who look at me and they see what I have gone through. And they see my situation that I'm in right now. And they say, you know what? If, if Paul can be a faithful witness for Jesus in his context, I can be a faithful witness for Jesus in my context. And if, it, and if it's to where the Apostle Paul will suffer for Christ, then far be it from me that I would be unwilling to suffer for Christ. And Paul's imprisonment and Paul's suffering and all the negativity that Paul went through gave, gave a boldness and a courage among others to be a witness for Jesus Amen. themselves. I tell you, when I look at, at, at folks like Jonathan Sapoma, it's always pictured down here in one of these, and I, and I think about people like Jonathan on the other side of the world witnessing for Christ and, and ministering in, in such tough situations. There in his family, taking his, his, his family, those precious little children, and there, and he's been there for over six and a half years now, ministering, serving the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. You know what that does to me? That tells me, hey, they can serve the, the Lord in that environment on the other side of the world. I think I can serve the Lord in Rock Hill. I, I think I can be a witness for Jesus here. And, and I think about other believers. I think about, about those who have been martyred for their faith. Those who have, who have suffered tremendously for the cause of Christ. Those who have given their life for the Lord Jesus. And, I, and what does it do? It does away with all of the reservations that I would have. Should. All the reservations that I would have. About speaking up for Christ. Sharing with others about the Lord Jesus. And I read this about Paul in Rome and, and, and saw his attitude and what he says. This has just happened for the furtherance of the gospel. My mind went back to, to Joseph, you know, with his brothers, when his brothers and Joseph got reunited. You remember how Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. The apostle Paul could look at those Roman soldiers and say, you know what, there's some folks who meant this for evil. But look what God has done. Yes, God has meant it for good. Aren't you glad that God's at work? Yes. And even though you and I may not understand it, we may not recognize the details, we may not be able to figure out what God's up to, God's always up to something and God's yes. always up to some good things. Amen. God's always up for good things. And God's always up for the advancement of the gospel of His Son. Yes. The second great truth that we find here in our text concerning why our faith gives us joy is that, that we have faith that God gives deliverance through prayer. Yes, Lord. And so therefore we, we have joy because we know that God, God's eye is upon us and God is able to give us the deliverance. In verse 18, the Bible says, Yes, and I will rejoice. The latter part of verse 18. Yes, I will rejoice. Why? Because I know this will lead to my deliverance through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so Paul says, you know what? As long as God wants me here, I'll be here. But I believe with all my heart God's going to give me deliverance. Yes. And I have confidence that He will. Amen. God will deliver me. And you know what? The Apostle Paul could look back over his life and, and he could remember when God had delivered him. Amen. Even in an incarceration experience back at, at Philippi. <laughs> at Philippi the, uh, the church of Philippi was the first European church. And it was established by the Apostle Paul. But it cost Paul some blood. It cost Paul pain. It cost Paul a beating. It cost him 
whips across his back. But while he was in that, that prison cell, while he was, he was in that terrible experience there in prison, he and Silas could sing praises to the Lord at midnight. Amen. And the Lord would, would rock that jail cell and, and he would set the Apostle Paul free. He knew, Paul knew, that what God did back there in Philippi, that he could do there in Rome. Amen. He knew that those shackles could fall off of him. He knew that that Roman soldier could fall down like a dead man. He knew that all of the accusers of the Apostle Paul could be, could be removed off of the stage of Paul's life. Paul knew all of that. And so he's just putting his trust in the Lord. And he says, God is my God and deliverer. And I put my confidence in him. And when the right time is before me, God will give me deliverance. Amen. And so he's trusting the Lord to work out all the details according to the, to the right timing of, of everything. You know, I, Paul, was, Paul was not there in the account that we read about in Acts chapter 12 with the Apostle Peter. But you know when Paul and Peter got together, sometime though that had come up in conversation. And, and you know that with Luke being a companion of the Apostle Paul, that, that Luke certainly uh, would convey what he had written about in Acts chapter 12 about the Apostle Peter as he would converse with the Apostle Paul. You remember how that, that Herod Agrippa the, the first had James executed with a sword. And he found that it was a good political move. There were Jews there in Jerusalem that rejoiced over the execution of, of, of James, the Apostle James. And so Herod was going to do the same thing with Simon Peter as soon as they got Passover behind him. God forbid that he, that he do anything to violate Passover, so he was going to wait by killing Peter until Passover was behind him. And so he's, he's waiting to execute Peter. I love the fifth verse of Acts chapter 12. The Bible there tells us that Peter was being kept in prison. And then the Bible says in verse, uh, five, uh, verse uh, uh, 5 of, of chapter 12 of Acts, but, but prayer was made Amen. of the church yeah. without ceasing unto God for him, Amen. for Peter. And so that tells me that because of the prayer of the church, yeah. God set things in order. And God dispatched an angel. And that angel came and brought Simon Peter out of the prison. And Peter thought he was having a dream, but it was reality. Amen. He was delivered. Yeah. And so Paul could think about Peter's experience being brought out of prison. Paul could think about his own experience of being rescued by God uh, from prison there in Philippi. And Paul was looking at his condition there in Rome. He said, you know what? God's got this. Amen. God has this. Why would I worry about this? God's track record, God always causes His people to triumph in His grace. Amen. And so He has His confidence in the Lord. One final thing that gives us reason to have joy uh, as our faith is, is, uh, is, is expressed and experienced and held on to by us, and that is this. We have faith that God provides His people with a great future. We have faith that God provides His people with a great future. God is at work even when we don't see God working in the midst of our difficulties. God is able to give us deliverance and He will deliver us according to His perfect timing and will. And we can have confidence that God will provide His people with a great future. Future. Look at what Paul has to say about his future in verse 20 and 21. My eager expectation and hope. He says, this is burning within me. My eager expectation. What I'm, what I'm greatly confident in and what drives me is that I will not be ashamed about anything. And ashamed there means disappointed. Okay, embarrassed and disappointed. He said, I'm not going to be embarrassed about God and the working of God. I'm not going to be disappointed in the Lord about anything. But that now, as always, with all boldness, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, living is 
Christ. Amen. For me, living is Christ. Paul said, I'm excited about today. Why? Because today's all about Jesus. Yes, Lord. Today's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus' will. It's all about Jesus' work. It's all about Jesus' character in me. It's all about Jesus' mission. It's all about what Jesus is doing. It's all about what Jesus is teaching me. It's all about my relationship with Jesus. And so I'm excited about today because today's all about Jesus. Amen. And you know what? I'm going to be excited about tomorrow. Yes. Because you know why? Tomorrow's all about Jesus. And I'm going to be excited about Tuesday. Why? Because Tuesday's all about Jesus. Yes. I'm going to be excited about Wednesday. Why? Because Wednesday's all about Jesus. Yes. I'm going to be excited about next week. Why? Because next week's all about Jesus. It's just all about Jesus. For me to live, it's Jesus. And so it's just, that's why I've got something to be excited about. That's why I have an eagerness and a great anticipation about my future. Why? Because it's all about Jesus. Paul says, it's not about Paul. It's not about my comfort. It's not about my possessions. It's not about, about my popularity. My life's all about Jesus. You see, when life gets all about Jesus, you'll get excited about life. Yes, Lord. You'll find joy in life when your joy is in Jesus. Amen. Life's all about Jesus. It's His character and His work. It's not worldly success and possessions and pleasure and power. It's Jesus. When that's your treasure, you'll have joy. Amen. Then he talks here not about a future where Christ is honored in this life, but a future where we are with him beyond this life. He says, for me to live is Christ, and then the latter part of that uh, uh, sentence, verse 21, and dying is gain. It's a promotion. Verse 21, verse 22 says, now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and, and, uh, and I don't know uh, which one I should choose. I'm pressured by both. I'm between a rock and a hard place. I have the desire to depart. Why? And be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. Far better, better. Immeasurably better than what I have here in this world. And so, I mean, what can they do, Paul? Send him to heaven. I mean, you don't, you don't worry about things when you know the worst thing they can do for you is send you to heaven. Right? I mean, that's why he could look at executioners and all and smile. Yeah. He's thinking, are you going to be the one who helps me walk through the bird of gates? That's the way Paul looked at him. He didn't worry about the details of his life because he knew that as long as he was in this world, God's grace would be with him. God would be taking care of him. And he knew that when he, when he drew his last breath in this world, that it was going to be the opportunity of seeing Jesus face to face. Amen. For me to live is Christ and to die is a promotion. For me to live is Jesus and to die is just all of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Because I'll be there with Christ. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 22 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for. We're anticipating. We're longing for. We look for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Who shall change our vile bodies, our yes, earthly Lord. bodies. They might, they might be fashioned like unto His glorious body. We'll be with the Lord. I really don't think that we understand how wonderful it's going to be to be with Jesus. Amen. Really don't. You know, we, we say things sometimes. I, I look forward to seeing my dad. I haven't seen my dad since 2001. And I look forward to, to seeing my dad. The last words my dad said, and I was holding his hand when he threw his last bread, and the last words he was able to say to me just a few hours before that was he pointed toward the ceiling. My dad had a massive stroke when he was 57 years old. He never said a sentence after that. Nothing more than one or two words. That was it. But he, he pointed toward the ceiling in the uh, nursing home room and he looked at me and he said, I want to go see him. Amen. I want to go see him. I never heard my dad say a sentence in, uh, from the time he was 57 until he was he was 77, 80, 20 years. I hadn't heard my dad say a sentence. And the last words my dad spoke is, I want to go 
See, I'm looking forward to seeing my dad. I'm looking forward to seeing grandparents. I'm looking forward to seeing others. Uh, so many friends I have on the other side. We, we, we had, we've had loved ones that have passed away. One of the men who was on my board of directors when I was, uh, was doing evangelism full time with the people of the Lord this past week. And, uh, you know, I've got so many treasures on in heaven. But, oh, listen. I want to see Jesus. And, and Jesus is the first one I want to see. I, I, I don't see anybody before I see Jesus. But I don't believe I will. I don't believe I will. I want to see the Lord. He will guide me with His counsel and afterwards receive me into glory. And I will be perfect, I will be complete when I see Him and I'm made in His likeness. Oh, the treasures that are waiting upon us as the people of God. That's by faith that brings me joy because I know that's what my future is. It's my eternal future. If you know that God is always at work in your life, then give you joy. If you know that it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, God is your deliverer. Yes, He is. That will give you joy. When you know that your days are God's presence to you, and that God only gives good things, that He's in charge of your Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, He's got 2018, your 2018 in His hand. He's got your 2019 in His hand. And God's going to be with you every step of the way. That will give you joy. Amen. And when you know that when you've taken your last step here in this world, you get to be with Jesus forever, Amen. that will give you joy. John MacArthur said that one of the greatest tests of, of one's level of spiritual maturity is what it takes to rob them of their Holy Spirit given joy. Think about it. What robs you of your joy? What takes your joy away from you? What we allow to rob us from our joy is, an, is indicative of the spiritual maturity of our life. May it be this day that we honor the Lord in the life of faith. And may our faith be demonstrated with real joy, with our confidence and our peace that we get through our relationship.